And then, um, as I already said in Slack, if you kind of want to look at your exam, please come to my office hours and you can look at your exam and then discuss with me any answers you gave and what, is, what was wrong and write about them. So, um, I guess I'll start. Um, okay, great. So I wanted to kind of like give a quick recap of uh, what we call, talk, talked about graphs when I last lectured. Um, and so like this is an important slide that we have these two different types of tasks in graphs, the attribute-based tasks and the topology-based tasks. Topology-based tasks are concerned with whatever um, I have in the structure of the graph, how are things related, how are nodes related, attribute-based tasks concern attributes about nodes or edges. And we discuss visualization techniques um, that are suitable for um, different types of topology-based and attribute-based tasks. Um, roughly, we have the three different types of graph representation, the explicit node link layouts, matrix layouts, and implicit layouts. We didn't talk about implicit layouts, um, we'll talk about them today. Um, the explicit ones are kind of the ones that we are all most familiar with. Um, we have node link diagrams where vertices are points and edges are uh, lines or arcs. Uh, and we have these uh, conflicting layout criteria. We don't want to have edge crossings. We don't want to have um, this different edge lengths between nodes. We don't want to ha um, have edges overlap with nodes and so on. And so we can try to optimize a layout uh, to find an, a, a good solution. We won't be able to probably find an ideal solution. Uh, and so we have these three major classes. The free layouts um, are um, the ones where you can essentially position the nodes arbitrarily. Style layouts is where you have some rule to lay out the nodes. And fixed layouts are whenever you have nodes on a map, for example, or in some other spatial context, and you cannot vary uh, your node positions. So this is about the conflicting criteria that I just mentioned. Um, for the free layouts, the force-directed layouts are a major uh, approach. This is like this physics model where the edges correspond to springs and the vertices reach positive ma magnets. Um, this is kind of computationally expensive. Um, uh, we need, uh, we have like a, a cubic runtime complexity, um, and there's also some uh, additional practical considerations like damping or center of gravity if you actually implement that. Um, this is kind of like a good solution for, um, let's say, graphs up to like 100 or 200 nodes. If you have more, you have to take it in a different approach because otherwise you would get into this giant hairball problem. Uh, style restricted layouts have the problem of edge cluttering and the one approach that we talked about uh, to address this is this hierarchical edge bundling or force directed edge bundling where we kind of like use in the case of hierarchical edge bundling some kind of structure of the nodes are related to each other to route uh, the edges along highways um, and therefore show connections in a better way. And so we have these like beta factor here that kind of show, um, is, uh, defines the bundling strengths from zero to one, um, probably somewhere in the middle is a good compromise. Um, where exactly always depends on your data set. Um, you can do this bundling approach for um, without a hierarchy in the background just by using forces on the edges uh, themselves, um, which is probably still not really easy to read, right? This graphs both are pretty dense and pretty difficult, and maybe like an aggregation approach where you show something more abstract would be the better approach here. So what are the benefits of explicit representations? Like it's easy to read, they're able to depict all graph classes, they can be customized um, by weighing different layout constraints, and they're really great for topology-based tasks. Um, so if I want to like, find the shortest path of a human and develop a good, uh, good layout, um, I, it's not terribly hard to do. Uh, the negatives are that the computation uh, of an optimal layout is in NP and even heuristics like the force directed layout um, is still slow and complex and we have a tendency of cluttering with, with these um, giant hair walls. Um, we talked about multivariate graphs. This essentially moves into this um, attributes when attributes are becoming important. Um, so attributes can influence topologies. For example, path along a network can be slowed down or blocked. The best route um, when driving somewhere depends on the traffic, so we need to consider attributes when we think about the network. Um, and we have here a challenge between, like, we want to do both topology and attribute-based tasks at the same time. Um, and how, like, one, 
we could have like many of these different node attributes that all match to a single node and like what how do we how can we visualize this and if you only have one or two you can do things like color coding color coding is sufficient for classes like if you have like one uh, one set of categories uh, of your nodes then color coding is of course the choice that you should take uh, but if you have more complex uh, data associated with the nodes People have tried all kinds of things that you can see here um, with these glyphs, uh, which are kind of limited in scalability. And so we talked about small multiples as being an approach where we show the same network multiple times um, with colored by different attributes. Um, we've talked about the pros and cons of small multiples uh, um, a lot already, so I'm not going to go into the detail. Um, this was an example for where we positioned the nodes based on attributes and we dynamically chose which two attributes to plot against each other. So here we have a network, um, and so we have one attribute on the x-axis, one attribute on the y-axis, and then the nodes are positioned according to those parameters, and the edges are rendered on top. So this is essentially a fixed layout uh, that is driven by the attributes. And then I showed this one example where we essentially um, use um, user uh, feedback on what is currently an interesting path, and the user selects the path, and then we show detailed information for that path by using a multiple coordinate view approach. Here we show the topology, here we show some of the topology that is relevant for the current selection, and then here we show experimental data. Um, I didn't talk about this, uh, but I, I, I thought I will add this for this recap. Um, if you want to visualize edge attributes, which are also of course important, um, if you want to, like these are the common ways of how people visualize edge attributes. Uh, if you have quantitative values, uh, the, you could use um, line width. Um, if you have ordinal values, you could use saturation. You could also saturation for quantitative values. Uh, uh, if you have nominal values, you could use style or color, stippling styles or color. Anybody have an opinion? So, like, is this going to work well here with the line width for, num for numerical data? Can you guess how many different numbers I can roughly read? And, uh, like, is it easy to, dis to discern those two here? It's okay, right? But if I have six or seven or eight, uh, it might get increasingly tricky. So this is an example that visualizes edges by line width uh, from an actual bioinformatics tool. This is uh, sashimi plots inside a tool. It's called the uh, uh, IGV. The, integrated um, genome viewer from the Broad Institute. Um, and what you see here are essentially like um, connections between different exons, but it's not so important. You can think of these regions here um, as the nodes, and these, these here are the links that connect that. Um, and these can have a high variability. Some of these connections are super rare. Some of them are extremely common. Um, and so right here we have a connection uh, that has and that corresponds to nine reads. Um, and then down here we have a connection that corresponds to 1,236 reads. Um, but other than reading the label, I couldn't tell them apart. Uh, just because this is so much, like we only have a couple of pixels to show this variation. If we want to make the nine reads visible, um, we, have to, um, uh, we have to give them at least some width. And if we don't want uh, 1,200 reads, um, block everything else, we have to limit them at some point. And so this is not a great visualization technique. There's lots of occlusions and overlaps. And so this is not an easy, uh, there's not an easy solution to this problem, right? There is, um, like, we, we've tried something. Um, so if you think about this a little bit more abstractly, this is kind of the graph that you have here. Um, and so what we did here is instead of, like, drawing these edges by width, we introduced little scatter plots. So Instead of showing this edge here, we kind of like introduced an, a, a redirection and then show a scatter plot. And now we can show um, like five or six different values uh, for that edge. So you can see that three of these um, edges or three of the values associated with this, X, uh, uh, with this edge are low. One of them is a little bit higher and two are really high. And if you continue like this, like we have the two edges here. We could do uh, scatter plots like that. So this would be here, the connection from here to here. Um, we can see that they have a little bit higher values. The connection from here to here has a little bit lower values. Um, 
and then you can continue like this and then you essentially get a scatterplot visualization of the edges. Um, I'm not saying this is the pre best or perfect solution. It's still a little hard to like follow the, the, the traces where things are going, but it's pretty good to judge um, the frequency of multiple items. Uh, and what is also nice about it is you can do like group comparisons. So if you have, for example, like control group and your experimental group, or you want to see A versus B, you can simply um, uh, divide it here and then show, okay, we see that the blue ones are higher here and here, uh, and the orange ones are lower at those two cases. Um, so this is how this looks like in a real data set. Um, this is again genetic data, but I don't want to go into the details. Um, here is just one real live example of how you can see um, an effect in two different cancers. This is leukemia and this is um, uh, brain cancer, glioblastoma multiform, and you can see that one particular part of a gene is much less used in one of those types of cancer, and that's, that's one thing that you can see in, in a visualization like this. So there's a tricky, uh, a tricky visualization for experts, not uh, immediately understandable, but if you can read it, um, it is pretty, um, it's pretty efficient for answering these specific questions. Um, then we talked about matrix representations. Um, matrix representations essentially uh, have lay out um, our nodes and links as rows and columns, and then wherever we have an edge, we fill in the edge. If we have an undirected graph, we have a symmetrical matrix across the diagonal. If we have a directed graph, the matrix is going to be asymmetrical. So we have then we distinguish between A to B and B to A. Um, Matrix representations are really well suited for neighborhood related topology based tasks. So for example, if I want to see what are the neighbors of B, I only have to scan the row. A, C, and D is the answer. But they're not well, well uh, rated, uh, not, they're not well suited uh, for uh, path related topology based tasks. So in this example, what is the connection from A to B uh, it is really hard uh, in the matrix. So it's really hard for me to actually uh, do this, I have to sit down and trace it with a pen. And as every time when we talk about matrices, the order is critical um, because then we can see the clusters um, very well. This is this Les Miserables data set. If we order the characters, this is co occurrence of the characters in, in Le Mis. Um, and we can see that if it's ordered alphabetically, so essentially random, uh, there is barely any clusters discernible, but if we order by frequency of co-occurrence, uh, then we can see that there is large clusters of people that occur together, and then we can easily also spot the main character, La Jean, who interacts with most people across all of the, um, across all of the book. So if you recap, matrices can represent all graph classes except for hypergraphs. So if you remember, hypergraphs are graphs that have edges that connect multiple nodes essentially in one stroke. Um, it puts the focus on the edge set, uh, so we can, like, it's not so much about the nodes, it's really about where are the connections. It is very simple to render because we don't have any elaborate layout algorithms. Um, it's well suited for attribute based tasks on the edges. So if you go back here um, and you want to simply read what, where, where are these different chapters, um, like, that's super easy to do because we have the color coded here, they're easily, uh, they're easily spotted. Um, and they are also here colored by how often they occur, um, so you can how often they co-occur, so you can easily see the variation here um, in in uh, in the edges. So this is a good way of visualizing edge attributes, um, um, and they're well suited for neighborhood-related topology-based tasks by simply scanning a column or a row. Um, they are limited because we need a lot of screen space to visualize uh, networks, and they are not well suited not well suited for path-related uh, topology-based tasks. Okay, so that's the recap. Um, and now I want to talk about trees. And I'll want to start with an exercise here. Okay, so the exercise is for you guys to Think about a tree visualization for your file directory on your computer. Um, I'm giving an example here from my, uh, from my directory where I have all my slides. Um, so you can see 
that we start with database 17 and then I have a folder for lectures and then I have an intro keynote file, then I have a perception directory, there I have a couple of files in there, then I have a data and graphs uh, keynote file, then I have a folder with my exams and then I have uh, a folder with the exercises. Um, so I have a tree structure here, but we also have attributes. So we see that the intro.keynote file is 110 megabytes large. And so what I want you to do is to sketch two different visualizations that show both the directory structure and the size of the directories and the contained files. So I want to be able to quickly identify like, how, what is the nesting here um, and which of these directories um, contains a lot of data. I don't want to only look at the uh, nodes, I also want to be able to read how big are the folders. Okay, so you welcome the team up, and that was our scratch paper.
Okay, so anybody want to describe their solution? Can you do it verbally? I mean, basically, it's like a, you have the two families, and then you have the yeah. means. Yeah, no, uh, it's hard to do. Uh, so you have the files and the folder stack all the with the width, signifying the size of file size. And then you have two folders that are so on and so forth. And then you click on the respective file, but you can kind of expand the other ones. So what is it doing? This is your folder. Yeah. I can and if I have a like, big folder, how and what how many fields? Okay. And then you have the you know, the other and you have to do it with the perspective of the Anybody else have a solution? Anybody want to draw a solution? No? <laughs> so, one way to think about this is you could simply draw a tree and then like any kind of encoding like darkness or bars and so on to show what is going in there, on, on there, in there. Um, but what we, uh, what I kind of wanted you to think about, because these attributes are important here, are kind of these implicit layouts. And there are three major implicit types of layouts. Uh, like the one that I actually don't have slides for because it's kind of trivial in the first place is this icicle plots. Um, and so the icicle plots, you take, uh, you, you take a tree and you draw the root as like at full width. So this is what I have here. It's actually, it should be a block. This is my top level, the root folder, database 2017, right? And then on the second level, I have three folders. And the folders, um, they, have, they have a width here that corresponds to the sum of, their si of the size of the files that are nested below it, right? So the width of the lectures folder here is the sum of the intro file, the reception key file, um, and all of these other files down there. Um, and then on the next level, I have so, like a file. Here, intro is a, is a file. I'm gonna like add that files. These are files. So here we see that essentially all the leaves here are files. Um, and then uh, in the intermediate, we have the folders. So lectures, intro, perception, guard, perception, graphs and then a data folder. In the exercise, we don't have any subfolders, we only have the, these files. And so that is kind of like nice uh, and easy to read. Uh, what can you see is a problem here? When you have files that are like killed by its size, it's not even, you can't put the name inside of it. Exactly, so I have that case here, so I would have to do something like a hover, I would show a tooltip or something like that, and then probably I would also have to at some point, like in a file system, there's many, many very small files too. So I might have to like find a threshold and then just say other, um, and then summarize these other files into like one node. So that's a good point. What happens if I have very, very deep hierarchies? Like 
And here I have only a hierarchy level of four, so that is kind of convenient, right? But if I have, I need an extra layer for every hierarchy level. Um, and so if I have one very deep directory and everything else is pretty flat, then I will get something like, like this. And I need even more and more space down here. Um, so that's the one solution. Is these are called icicle pods. Um, the other solution is to have here, this is called um, a sunburst, a radial layout, or um, yeah, sunburst is the canonical name for it. Um, here I have my root of the tree. Um, and what I'm doing here is instead of um, laying this out um, by space, I'm laying it out by angle, much like a pie chart, right? So my root has 100% uh, because it contains everything. Then I have the first folder, the lectures folder, um, and this is the lectures folder here. Uh, and you can see that it has about like 40% of the angle. Um, in the lectures folder, I have subfold like I have one subfolder. This is the subfolder, and then here I have again a file or files. And so here I essentially can um, like do something very similar to this. You can just think about this as like wrapping it onto a circle, um, that's the same idea. Um, and so these are two different um, visualization techniques. And the third one um, that I didn't sketch yet is the tree map. And in the tree map, um, or maybe let's talk about what are the pros and cons of this one. So we have the similar problem, right? If you have very small files, uh, we have problems here. Um, if you have very deep hierarchies, we have problems here. And so what commonly happens um, is um, if you have very deep hierarchies that these, um, these techniques actually stop drawing at some point and then simply show you a triangle and say, okay, there's something more um, and you can drill down here uh, if you want to. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, and so, like what is perceptually more efficient? The icicle plots, yeah, because it's easier for us to judge um, the width of something than the angle of something. Um, still, those are pretty popular um, because they kind of like are, um, I think, because they're engaging and interesting. Um, and the third method uh, is uh, the third implicit method is. Oh, and by the way, why is this called implicit methods? It's because we have not an explicit edge from here to here, but just because of how it's nested and arranged can we read the tree structure. We, can, we know that everything that touches the lower part um, of, uh, of, uh, of this rectangle is a child of it. And so this is a, an implicit visualization of the tree structure um, without explicitly showing the links. And the third common visualization um, is, is leaf-centric, and that's called a tree map. And so in a tree map, um, I would start out with one big square, and then I would divide it up. I have three folders, two of them are above equal in size, so I'll do this, and then one of them is smaller. Okay, so this is like now my lectures folder. Um, this is my exercise folder. And this is my exams folder. And then in here, um, I nest the elements. In the lectures folder, I have one intro file. Then I have a perception, um, uh, a perception uh, subfolder. Let's say put this here, um, and then I have like one other file, the data. And in this perception, um, I have a subfolder that contains two elements. That is, in this file, in this case, like a keynote file and whatever, like a video. So essentially, we take a rectangle and we um, slice it up according to the size of its, of its contained elements 
Um, and then we visualize this by these rectangular areas. So what is the problem with this visualization technique? Labeling. Labeling clearly can be problematic because um, here I have easily, like I can easily label them, uh, or more easily because I have horizontal space. What other problem can, can you see? The proportion is like they all, because in the perception folder you've got two files in there. Well, that's my fault, I didn't draw it exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do it right. <laughs> It uh, has the inherent problem of the area again. I mean, like, how far are you going to break it down? Yeah. So actually, that is um, the like this is actually well suited for very deep hierarchies, because essentially, if I have very deep hierarchies, I could just keep splitting it up. So it doesn't really need more space for deeper hierarchies compared to these other techniques. So if I want to see every single file in my computer, this is a good visualization technique. The problem of this visualization technique is that it's hard to know the structure of the tree, right? Um, it's hard to retrace like, what is exactly the branching structure that leads to this folder. Um, so there's all of these trade-offs to make. Um, and these tree maps are, are pretty popular. They're one of the most cited um, paper in information visualization. And probably, you've probably seen them before. So let's take a look at those. Um, so tree maps, I kind of like have showed this already. Um, here is another example of how such a tree map is created. Um, like you have a white root node, um, and then you have these green and yellow leaves. Then you have a blue subfolder, and that blue subfolder is divided into like subtrees further and further and further. And so uh, this technique is very well suited for things like visualizing files. Um, here's an example. I actually used, like I used to be, when I was my early, like the end of, like when I was still in high school and then at the beginning of college, I was a systems administrator uh, for a company and I used those tools, this, these tree map tools um, to actually find, like this was back in the 90s when, the, when disks were still expensive and I used those tools to find like um, where are files that I could delete to save disk space and this is now an actual visualization of my uh, hard drive, uh, all the files that I have. And so, like if I, like this big folder here are all my, like all of this here on the left are my personal photos. Like you can see and there's like a big movie in here. Um, and then here we have uh, a GoPro video. That's why I never bought a GoPro camera because it just suck up so much space. This is a single GoPro video. Um, and then here is my work stuff. Uh, and you can see that in my work, uh, in my work um, folders, my lectures um, take up a lot of space too. Um, so here, this is the, the teaching folder, like the upper quadrant here. These are all, uh, this is actually what we have um, looked at here, um, or this, this example. And then we can see that there's some like uh, interaction, like it's, it's hard to see it, but there is like labels for which files are those. Uh, individually, and then you can click on them, uh, or you can then say like, "Show this to me in Finder," and then you can delete them if you want to. So um, there's visualization tools for all platforms like this. Um, one problem with the original approach of the original tree map approach, what the original tree uh, map approach did is it sliced the areas only in one direction. So it did what it had here. If you have like subfolders with six, six, four, three, two, two, one, this is how the original approach would have sliced it, uh, either horizontally or vertically, and that would lead to these not very readable tree maps. Um, and so a good a good approach that now everybody is using is the squarified tree map approach, and this is a pretty simple algorithm. Um, what this algorithm does is um, it puts in. Um, a folder, or let's say, uh, um, yeah, I'm just gonna say folder. Um, it's, it puts in a, a folder um, first, and then puts in a second folder, um, and then it tries to minimize uh, the um, the ratio between the sides. Um, and then if it, it keeps doing that, but here we can see that the ratio isn't so great, so it traces back. Like this, this has improved the ratio between the sizes. This step, this one here has. Um, uh, 
decreased um, the, the ratio between the sides. And so instead of uh, slicing this further, um, it adds a new level uh, here to the side and puts it in there. And then it keeps going, like here the three fits in well here. If we try the two, the ratio is actually going down. Um, so this is not the right step. Instead, we are placing the two up here. And then we try to, uh, to slice the two in this way and so on. And then we get the square fried tree map. Um, and so this is a pretty simple algorithm. Um, and you get from this, which is basically, we have these very like thin slivers here that are not readable to this representation here where we can see every single node and we have roughly square uh, nodes because we, we optimize for the ratio of the two sides of each of these rectangles. Um, when you want to visualize the structure of the tree with three maps, you can do so by essentially adding borders. Um, so here is like, um, if we don't have the borders and only show the leaves, we can kind of guess on the structure based on um, on the nesting level, so we can see that this, well, but it's ambiguous sometimes, right? This here could be one folder, but probably it's actually two folders that have very similar things. Um, and it's easier to see if we give every folder a couple of pixels for a border. And what's the problem of adding this border? If we have very deep hierarchies, we're suddenly not faithful to the size of the rectangles anymore. So it makes it a lot harder to um, create to essentially faithfully represent the size of the nested elements. Um, but generally the structure here is of course easier to see, still not perfect. Um, this is an example for a zoomable tree map. So like from the New York Times. Hello. Um, so this is a budget proposal. Um, you can see quite well that health and human services here is a big chunk, social security is a big chunk, but then you can zoom down. You have Veterans Affairs, then um, in, within the Veterans Affairs you have Department of Administration, then you have Benefits Program, and then you have Health Administration, um, and so on. And so you can zoom around here, um, and they also use the color scale to see the changes. Um, uh, compared to the previous budget. So zooming here is, is, is one option of essentially making those labels visible uh, and to let people explore. Of course, I kind of le le uh, lose a little bit of the context. Um, yeah, I showed this grand perspective on Windows. Um, there is Sequoia View, uh, which is actually uh, developed by the guy or by the group that developed the squarefied research, uh, um, uh, the squarefied um, uh, tree map layout algorithm, um, and you can download it, and it's, it works for Windows. This one works for Mac quite well, and there is super handy tools for uh, finding the big files. Um, here's an example, because I, want, I said earlier that they're great for showing a lot of data. This is an example of a million, like a, a folder structure with a million items. And you can, still, um, you can still see what is going on here. Um, so essentially, as long as you have, um, you can represent a file. Um, and so um, these are pretty scalable with respect to uh, the number of leaves. Um, here, this is the sunburst technique. Um, and in the sunburst technique, you can also do things like th these details effect here. Um, I showed this video in the, in the very first lecture. Um, where I select a sub-element, like a, a sub-folder, and then that becomes kind of the new root. So here, oops. So here, now I have selected a subfolder somewhere here, and the subfolder becomes the new root, and we see the original disk here in the middle for context. And so I can then go in and deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, navigate into the hierarchy, uh, and still have an understanding of where I am roughly in my graph. And then because this is such a nice radial layout, it is well suited for these fancy uh, animations. Um, and this also shows you how you could potentially approach labeling this by, um, by like using these ticks um, and then 
um, aligning it here on the side uh, horizontally. Um, there is a D3 implementation of this. Somehow it doesn't like my links today. So this is a zoomable sound burst for D3, if it works. Okay, the example is broken, but anyways, there is D3 uh, instances for that. Um, yeah, so I think we talked about the differences in the pros and cons uh, when I showed these examples over there, so we don't have to go over that. Um, but yeah, so essentially, like this, this is kind of the same, the visualization of the same thing. Here I have a file directory and see all of the details. Here I have a file directory and I see mainly the structure and I have to navigate to actually see the details. Um, so if we reflect on implicit representations, they're pretty space efficient because of the lack of explicitly drawn edges. Uh, they scale well up to very large graphs. Um, they're well suited, especially the icicle plots and the sunburst layouts. Uh, they're well suited for um, attribute based tasks on the node set or for attribute based tasks on the node set, also of course the tree maps. And then depending on which ones, uh, they're also well suited for topology based tasks. So sunburst, quite well suited uh, for uh, topology based tasks as are icicle plots, uh, tree maps not so much. A negative is, of course, that they can only represent trees. We can't represent general graphs. Um, and since the node positions are used to represent edges, they cannot not be freely arranged. For example, you can't use this to show geographical positions. Um, and they're also useless to pursue any tasks on the edges. So if you have edge attributes, that's simply the wrong uh, visual encoding. Um, and then spatial relationships, such as overlap or inclusion, uh, lead uh, to occlusion but I guess we didn't talk about any of the techniques where that actually applies. Um, there is a website that I want to recommend to you that essentially made it, like it made, uh, has, to the, has a goal of cataloging every existing tree visualization technique out there. Um, and you can go to this website. It's treevis.net. Um, and then you can find based on a design space of whether it's a 2D, a 3D, or a hybrid, whether it's explicit, implicit, or hybrid, and so on. And then you can look at all of these different visualization techniques. And I'm just going to find something very curious, like an implicit one that is also three-dimensional. And then you get something like these stacked hemispheres here, uh, which is not necessarily a good visualization technique, uh, or like a a 3D sunburst sphere. Um, so all of this have been published, or here we have like a botanical tree, um, or nested hemispheres, or this beam trees, and so on. Um, but there's of course very reasonable visualization techniques in here, so like if we just look at explicit ones, we can see that there's the like, like historical, very simple ones, and so on. Um, if you want to like visualize graphs, um, you can do, of course do that with uh, by implementing it yourself uh, in D3. Um, but there's also graph visualization software out there that you could use. Gephi is one of them. Um, that's a general purpose graph visualization um, a framework that can do many different layout algorithms and also some uh, attribute visualization. The other one is Cytoscape. Cytoscape is pretty popular in the biology community. Um, it has a lot of plugins uh, that you can use to do various things, for example, mapping experimental data on the nodes. Um, Cytoscape has a web version um, uh, too. The other version is uh, a Java-based downloadable. And then Network X is a, a library um, that you can use um, essentially more for doing, um, for doing like graph analysis, but also some visualization. Okay, so that's graphs, um, and now I want to move on uh, to the main topic of today, which would be filtering and aggregation. Um, so we talked about uh, filtering and aggregation when we talked about interaction. So I'll keep the filtering part short, and then I want to talk mainly about aggregations 
about things like how do we do simple aggregations based on histograms, and then we'll talk about a couple of more fancy methods like uh, clustering and dimensionality reductions. Um, okay, so uh, for filtering, essentially, I can filter based on items and attributes, and for aggregation, I, uh, equally, I can uh, aggregate based on items or attributes. Um, when we filter, we eliminate elements. And so the question is, what drives the filter? And the answer to that is that it's any possible function that partitions the data set into two sets. So you can say bigger or smaller than something, a fold chance, it's noisy or it's insignificant. So you can be arbitrarily uh, creative about how to apply a filter. Um, and the one thing that I, um, I like to think about um, there's, there's three different things, right? There's queries, there's filters, and then there's highlighting. And all of those three things are very closely related. Um, so um, you could actually probably implement all of them. It doesn't make necessarily, it's not sensible, but you could implement them all, all the same way and just use different representations for them. So for me, like a query is where you start with zero and add in elements. So you kind of like start with a blank canvas and add in elements. That is like a suitable approach if you have a massive data set. For example, if you want to do Google search, you don't want to filter all possible websites down uh, to see something that you might be interested. You want to take the other approach of like saying, what are you interested in? And then query for that. Um, the filter is exactly the inverse of that. You start with everything and then remove elements. Um, and so queries are good if you already have a sense of what you want to see. Filters are good if you want to first look at the data and based on what you learn, uh, apply a filter. And then highlighting is very much like filtering, uh, just that you uh, only select a couple of items and don't remove the rest. So all of those approaches um, uh, are very related. They depend on the data set size and on your task. This is a historic example for item filtering, so like the movie finder uh, is again from Bench and Eiderman's group. Um, here we have a scatter plot of time versus popularity and then you can apply various different filters um, and then only those, uh, those filtered um, items remain visible. Um, here is a modern example, which again, it's not going to work. Um, this is an interesting visualization about um, restaurant um, health code violations in, in Manhattan, or not violations, but um, the health code grades. And so you could actually look up where, in which um, restaurants in, in New York City have they found evidence of rodents. Um, and um, then I can essentially zoom in and see, okay, which are the restaurants uh, which have evidence of rodents or have evidence of insects. So I'm filtering by the type of health code violation, food temperature, and then I can do combined filters, evidence of rodents, but only, let's say, American cuisine. Um, and then I can see, okay, this particular restaurant here has had rodents um, and serves American food. Um, or I can filter also by health grade, so if I have like really bad restaurants here, Brasserie 8 to 12 um, has uh, a great C. And so that's a way of essentially filtering down a bigger data set based on these different attributes here. Very simple implementation. Um, we talked a little bit about scented widgets. Um, the, like, up to now, like, we, we've talked about widgets that we use to filter something. Um, they've just been sliders. Um, but and sometimes, like, more often than not, it's better to do direct manipulation, to select something directly on the visualization, but sometimes that simply doesn't work. Um, and so in those cases, you can use scented widgets. And so the idea of scented widgets is that you not only provide something to interact with, but show what the possible consequences are in the background. So here, the slider is not only a slider, but it also visualizes a histogram of all the data items behind it. And so you can see that the majority of the items here are on the left, and then here, there's only very few items. And if I essentially change that slider to inclu include only those elements, I know that I still have the majority of my graph. Um, here is a, another example of a scented widget where the size of the data set is visualized by the saturation of the color. Um, here uh, we have um, a, a tree um, based on um, like add color by attributes. So essentially, these are widgets that we use to interact with software that are scented because they also show us something about the underlying 
uh, data set. Um, similar to that, we can have interactive legends. So here we have a legend uh, uh, that um, essentially shows us the bubble sizes and then we can actually interact by dragging those sliders here to filter directly in the legend. Um, so here this is like um, for different bubble sizes and we say we only care for bubbles from size 6 to 25. Um, so you can make those, um, you can make those uh, legends smart and then like not waste space or not make it more complex by simply creating one interface for filtering and interacting and one interface to show you the legend. Um, you can combine that in, a, in an efficient way. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about, um, about uh, filtering and now I want to talk about um, aggregations. And so what is aggregation? Aggregation is when I want to represent a group of elements by a typically smaller number of derived elements. So I'm trying to find some kind of like representative, um, um, let's say, I'm trying to group uh, some items and then represent them somehow how in a more efficient way so that I can still reason about the underlying data. And mostly I of course want to do this because I, want, I have too many items to visualize in the first place. Um, so. Um, the most common way to visualize or to aggregate are histograms. Like if you just want to see the distribution of a data set, you simply want to um, play, you, you simply first want to see a histogram. And so this here, and I'm gonna not spend too much time on this, but you should look at this at home, um, is an, an, like, histograms are easy to understand, but this is a very nice um, explanation of how a histogram is, co uh, is created in the first place. So uh, here the items are sorted into a list and then they're essentially like um, put into like on this, this unit scale or on a scale here and then um, within that scale we create this, these bins here um, and then we come up with the histogram. So we can see that this big bar here represents those individual data points um, and then of course like an item uh, right around the border, there is like very little difference between uh, items that are kind of like left of here and right of here. Um, that's kind of like the nature of uh, of these uh, of histograms that we have this kind of uncertainty. So we simplify a data set. And so for a histogram, it doesn't matter whether it represents 100 points or 10 million points, right? It is a very simple um, summary of a data set. Um, and so, yeah, I would encourage you to read through this because it's a, it's a deep introduction into histograms, although histograms are not particularly hard. Um, so the thing that about histograms that makes them a little bit tricky is that a good number of bins tends to be really hard to predict. And so my suggestion for you would be to, instead of trying to come up with a, like if you build a general purpose visualization tool, um, instead of trying to predict that automatically, is to make it interactive. Um, let people choose the number of bins that they want to show. Uh, but there's a couple of rules of thumb that are helpful to choose uh, initial bin sizes. The first one is the square root of n, so depending on how many items you have, the square root of that should be your number of bins. Uh, another approach would be the log 2 of n plus 1. Um, so here's two different examples. So here we have the number, uh, a number of passengers with 10 bins versus 20 bins. And so it looks like here we essentially, if we have the 10 bins, it looks like, well, people between uh, 0 and 15, they tend to not be, like, they tend to be, like, equally uh, frequently using, like, B passenger on this bus line, for example. But if we increase the bin size, we can actually see that there is a, a, a big chunk of, of this bin here um, is actually younger people between 0 and 5 years old. So there's lots of babies and toddlers riding on this bus and less so of the school aged children, uh, for example, because maybe those uh, kids are riding school buses. Um, I don't know the details. But this is just an example of an effect that you can e easily miss um, if you um, choose the wrong bin size. You could also do unequal bin width. This is a New York Times visualization of the average meal at Chipotle. Um, and so you can see that the average uh, meal at Chipotle or the biggest or the, the most frequent uh, calories at Chipotle are around a thousand calories. That's like what the typical burrito has. But you can actually, this is for a single order, 
but you can actually order stuff at Chipotle that has um, more than 2,000 calories, um, as you can see here in this histogram. Um, and then you could say, well, um, I have this like concentration here, and I could do unequal bin width. Uh, but the problem with unequal bin width is, of course, that now you have to judge area um, instead of the height of the bars, and we know that perceptually that is much harder to do. And so I personally think that um, you probably shouldn't use um, these unequal bin width, um, but rather should stick with the uh, equal bin width. Um, a, a different approach, um, an elegant approach, is actually the kernel density estimates or density plots. Um, here you essentially have some smoothing function, for example a Gaussian kernel, um, that you run over a distribution, um, and then you can represent the data with a curve instead of having the histogram uh, behind it. Um, a very space efficient way um, of visualizing distributions are box plots. Um, you probably have all seen them a lot. Um, they are called box plots or box and whisker plots. Um, one important caveat for box plots is that you always have to show outliers as points uh, because many people simply show the box plots, but then they, they tend to like, not show that there is actually data outside of that range. Um, and so a box plot is defined by like the median here is the center line, and then you have the interquartile range between quartile one and quartile three um, as the left edge, respectively the right edge of this box in the middle. And then the, the whiskers here represents quartile one minus 1.5 interquartile range, or quartile three plus 1.5 times interquartile range. However, you have to be careful, and you have to whenever you use those you always have to specify that because there's many different definitions of box plots. Um, so these, these are not standardized. This is the most common one, but what exactly the whiskers mean um, is not clearly defined. Um, box and whisker plots are great for normal distributed data, uh, but they're not so great if you have some funky distribution, and especially bad for bi or multimodal distributions. And so what do I mean by that? Like here I have a normal distribution and here this box plot is an appropriate representation. But for this bimodal, uh, for this bimodal distribution here in the second row, um, very clearly this box plot doesn't give you the, uh, the right idea about the data set, right? Uh, and the same here for this peaked or the skewed distributions. Um, here we have an outlier that essentially uh, all of them result in the same box plot. So box plots are not as good as histograms, but they can be much more space efficient. Uh, you can also show notch box plots. Um, the notches then are typically used um, to show you essentially the 95% confidence interval if you kind of want to make inference about statistical significance. Um, because essentially you can uh, reason about if two distributions have no overlap in the 95 confidence interval, then you can say that they have a p-value of, of smaller than 0 0.5, and so you can make inference about significance here. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't hold the other way around. If you have an overlap, you could still have a significant relationship, but um, you, you know that if they don't overlap, that you, you, you do have a significant relationship. Um, yeah, and so this is like basically the box plot is the same. Uh, the notch here shows the 95 confidence interval. So these are pretty subtle, but they, like, those are pretty um, commonly available in, in the statistical plotting packages like ggplot for R. Uh, or matplotlib uh, for Python. Um, I do like this uh, XKCD comic on uh, box plots, why you should plot outliers. Um, so he's complaining that um, he's not uh, her boyfriend, they're also uh, dating other people, but then she shows him that um, he spends twice as much time with her than anyone else, she's a clear outlier, um, and so he, she's her statistically significant other. Um, so, but the point here being, um, you need to show those outliers to kind of like get people a better sense of what is going on. So here we have um, box plots for different distributions. Um, therefore, an exponential distribution, the box plot would look like this. Clearly not something that you want to show. Uh, for a Poisson distribution, uh, I think the box plot isn't terrible. For a normal distribution, um, it is a good choice. Um, as you can see here, like that is a faithful representation, and for a uniform uh, distribution, it's also not a good choice. And 
what you also see in a lot of papers um, is that they show distributions with um, error, like with bar charts plus error bars. That is terrible. You should never ever show uh, a visualization with bar charts plus error bars. There's many reasons for that. Uh, one of them is the within the bar bias. Um, so here is um, essentially um, a comparison of uh, a couple of uh, different, uh, here, um, two different distributions. Um, if you just showed us with bar chart error bars, you would think that those are exa exactly the same. But if you actually, um, if you actually look at the, the raw data, you can identify that there is um, quite something else going on. Um, so that you can actually make inferences about uh, subgroups in those patients here pretty well, which you couldn't uh, in, in uh, this particular case here. A variation of um, a box plot is the uh, violin plot, which shows us a kernel density estimate um, on the side here. And so here we can easily spot a bimodal distribution. Um, so these violin plots are, are kind of like they convey a lot of information. Not everybody can read them, uh, and they're a little bit harder to draw uh, because you first have to uh, calculate the KDE. Of course, uh, this is again ggplot, uh, and ggplot has those built in. Um, if you show uh, some expected value plus uncertainty, so not a distribution, but if you have some kind of like expected value, uh, um, expected values plus minus some confidence interval, for example, um, these are like four different ways of showing them, and this here was a study that compared them. Uh, and bar, again, bar charts with error bars are a bad idea. Um, box plots are not appropriate because they're not a distribution. Um, so what you could do instead is you could have like those fading bands or you could have the violin pods and these are kind of like good representations of this kind of um, expected value plus uncertainty. Um, if we want to aggregate in 2D, uh, we can do binning. So for example, here we have um, like these very dense clusters here and instead of drawing every point, we can simply calculate a grid. Um, and then visualize intensities. Um, we talked about this when we talked about scatter plots, and I showed this example for data war um, that shows the uh, 100,000 data points in these bin uh, scatter plots and histograms. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip over this. Um, next, I want to talk a, a little bit about spatial aggregation. Um, spatial aggregation is super interesting, also from a um, political point of view because this is what gerrymandering actually is. Um, so the problem is really hard. Um, spatial aggregate, how do you slice um, a region so that it's like a fair representation, right? You could, like how, how do you draw the boundaries based in a, on, on, in a sensible way? You could, you could try a grid, uh, you could try some like um, different, um, different configurations and then if you want to aggregate like it somehow represent this, um, then it, um, we, we don't have like faithful representations, right? So here we, it looks like, um, well, it's hard to say, but essentially this here is clearly not a good representation because it tends to underrepresent certain areas uh, outside here. This here looks like everything is completely evenly distributed. So um, it's, it's a hard problem, the spatial, um, uh, uh, spatial <coughs> aggregation in general. Um, and so this is kind of what gerrymandering is about. Like, who knows what gerrymandering is? Like in the U.S., uh, political districts are drawn uh, based on census data. So, for example, in Utah, we have four congressional districts, and those four congressional districts, uh, they, they actually changed in 2002 because Utah grew after the 2002 census. The number of uh, districts in Utah was increased from uh, three to four. Um, and then you have to redraw those boundaries. And the idea being that you have a representative democracy, that a congressman is responsible for a certain region. And ideally, the idea was that this is some kind of homogeneous district, um, that um, uh, homogeneous, especially homogeneous, so that you have kind of like um, a congressman representing a group of people and that people have a direct line to the government. Um, but then people realize that you can actually play tricks by drawing those districts. And so here is a simple explanation. If I have 550 people here, um, if I just did not, no geospatial dis, uh, no geospatial districting, 
I would have a 60% of the votes would go to blue, 40% to uh, red. Okay? If I have um, a perfect representation, and I would slimly slice it up here in the columns, I would have three blue, two, uh, three blue districts, two red districts, and blue would win. Um, if I have this compact representation here, uh, where I slice it by two rows each, I would suddenly have five blue districts, but zero red districts, and that's obviously not fair. Because here, 40% of the voters uh, did not get a say at all. Um, and then here in this example, I actually managed to take um, a red minority and slice up the districts in a smart way so that red gets more districts by essentially loading, um, the bl uh, like stacking all of the blue people into one area and then making sure that the red people are just enough in the other areas that they will win the district. So wherever like blue wins an election, it wins heavy-handedly, but then red wins by a small margin in many different districts. And so that's a very common thing uh, for politicians in the United States to do, to draw districts where that is optimized to essentially give their party an advantage. And then you get such interesting districts as you have here in Pennsylvania, where the Democrats won 51% of the votes, but only five out of 18 House seats, um, and that's one of the districts here. And that's clearly not a geographically compact district in any way. And there's actually currently a Supreme Court uh, case pending on that, and so that's an op open problem where even mathematicians like try to figure out a good answer, um, and it's not clear that there is a good answer. There's not, a, there's not gonna be a completely unbiased and fair way, but kind of very clearly this is not uh, an unbiased and fair way. So this is a Utah example. Um, until 2002, Utah was three districts. Like we had um, essentially the northwestern part, and then we had the southeastern part, and then we had Salt Lake. Um, that was the map until 2002. And then, uh, of course, Salt Lake is kind of a liberal island in a, a pretty Republican uh, state, and so it wasn't uncommon that Salt Lake was carried by a Democrat and all the, and the other two were carried by a Republican. But then when Utah got an additional district, um, they did actually slice off Salt Lake into four parts uh, and packed it in with lots of uh, Republican landmass here. So you can see now that Salt Lake has, uh, is part of, the Salt Lake area is part of all four congressional districts uh, in Utah. And ever since they've done that, no Democrat has won a congressional seat in Utah. Um, this is the 2016 congressional elections here. Um, this is how the current map looks like. Um, and if it were like a hypothetical nonpartisan map, the outcome would be that it would be one Democratic representative in Utah. So yeah, uh, it's, it's really a hard problem. And if you give people who have a bias uh, a say in how to slice up districts, um, you get unfair results. Uh, one approach to partition spatial data are Voronoi, Voronoi diagrams. And so Voronoi diagrams are really neat um, uh, partitions that essentially give them a set of location. Um, they partition space into regions of closeness. So here uh, we have for this dot, this pink region here um, is where, um, for, for every point in this pink region, this dot here is the closest one. So here, this one is the closest one. If I move here, this one is the closest one. Um, in D3, you have a Voronoi layout. Maybe if I restart my browser. Yes. In D3, you have a Voronoi layout. Um, and so you can then create um, you, the, and Voronoi diagram of like what is the closest airport uh, to any place in the United States. Um, and so you, you can just look at this Voronoi diagram, then look at where, do you, where, is, where are you currently flying if you have, for example, an emergency, and then you can say, okay, this is the closest airport, this is where I should go. Um, and so Voronoi diagram are pretty neat, and they have also, um, like this is again a world airport, uh, world airports in Voronoi, and you can see that around the oceans, these, these cells tend to be pretty big. Um, Voronoi diagrams are also like, this is a side remark, um, not for data visualization, but or not for actually visualizing the data, but for interaction. You could use, you can use these Voronoi diagrams 
as a way to make interaction with visualizations easier. Um, so I wanted to show this example is better. So here I have a line chart, and it can be pretty tricky to like pick a line like this, right? Because I have to be very precise about navigating and selecting that line. And so what, what this implementation here does is it always finds the closest point to wherever my cursor is. See where my cursor like here? I put my cursor in here, and it finds the closest point to my cursor. And by moving this around, um, it's pretty easy for me to pick, uh, to, to navigate and to pick what I'm interested in. Like if I, like here, for example, you can see um, that I uh, have a, like, it's pretty, I don't have to be super precise with my interaction. It makes it much easier for me. I only have to be precise when, when there is precision absolutely necessary when I have very dense regions. And so how is that implemented? Um, there is a Voronoi diagram here in the background. And a segment of a line um, is always assigned to a Voronoi cell. Uh, and wherever I hover um, in any of these Voronoi cells, the corresponding um, element um, is, is then selected. And so there's this Voronoi distillation in the background, and instead of picking um, the actual line segments, I'm picking the Voronoi cells. And that makes the interaction super, super smooth and easy. Um, and that is quite easy to do in D3 too. And here's this other example that explains this um, nicely um, also for uh, other charts. So here I have a scatter plot where I simply can get just close to a point and it will always be selected. Um, and this also breaks it down how you do this in detail and how you can do this for different charts um, and so on. So how do we create a Voronoi diagram? Um, so for to create the best way to create a Voronoi diagram is, is to first create a Delaunay tri triangulation. And the Delaunay triangulation is a triangulation where no vertex are in a circle described by the vertices of a triangle. So what does it mean? Um, it means that um, I take three nodes, um, and I don't have triangles yet, I try to draw a, th a circle, and if there is no other node within that circle, then that is a valid triangle in a Delaunay triangulation. And so I keep doing this by, like, the algorithm essentially um, dynamically adds points. Um, so you start out with only three points, um, and then you add a, another point, and you, then you try check your Delaunay triangulation again. And so you can do this uh, the Delaunay triangulation uh, in a pretty efficient way. Um, and then the Voronoi diagram is essentially the edges that are perpendicular to the triangle edges. So here we have the, in black, the Delaunay triangulation of this point set, and then the Voronoi diagram here is shown in red. Um, there is a link here that explains that quite well. Um, and so that's a useful, uh, well, useful thing to know. And so that is 320 exactly, and then I'll start talking about clustering next time. Um, and we will then continue on with set visualization and text visualization. See you on Thursday.